Welcome back to Criminal Justice 325 here at Setting Bull College, our undergraduate constitutional law course. I'm your instructor, Kara Damari. Today we are looking at the U.S. Constitution, particularly the text of the U.S. Constitution. We're starting out in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives, looking at one of the four pages of the original Constitution, US Constitution document. I'm gonna use the word Constitution a lot throughout this unit uh, on the US Constitution and the text of it. Uh, and so please infer that to mean the US Constitution, not the Standing Rock or other constitutions, which we will be discussing in other videos. So the Constitution starts out, you can see it right there in big letters with we the people. Right, we the people. Pause on that for a second and think, what does that mean? Who were those original writers of the Constitution referring to when they wrote we the people? Were they referring to native people? Were they referring to women? Were they referring to uh, African American slaves? Who are they referring to with we the people? Uh, it does echo the Declaration of Independence, you might note, which says one people, right? And there is something we see in that, which is this camaraderie. It's this joining together of people, right? We, the people, that is in the biggest letters, we see it right there. It's everyone coming together uh, or purportedly coming together in the creation of this document and unifying, right? And so this is, the beginning of this first part of the US Constitution, which is known as the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. I don't know if perhaps like me, you had to learn that in elementary school, grade school, but it's still on the tip of my tongue. And that is the preamble to the US Constitution. You'll note that it's fairly broad, right? It does things that we look for in an introduction. It says who it is, who we the people, right, of the United States or you know, whoever we the people refers to. In order, it says the purpose, in order to form a more, more perfect union and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our us. Our, our, our posterity. Who do they mean when they mean our posterity? They are referring to basically future generations, right? So the generations to come. In order to form a more perfect union, secure the blessings and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our, pars, our posterity. So in order to make a better government, let's say, and provide a certain amount of freedom to the people of the time or a select group of people of the time and uh, the people to come or perhaps their people to come do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. We see the preamble dipping a little bit into some of the other topics which will come up within the constitution, the domestic tranquility, establishing justice, providing for the common defense, unifying in order to do these things, promoting the general welfare, etc. cetera. Uh, and that, that scope, that in order to form a more, more perfect union, we'll note that that's more than had previously existed in order to form a perpetual union. Perpetual union was the name or was the language that was used in the Articles of Confederation, which came before the US Constitution and we've discussed or will discuss. Uh, and so we really have a fairly broad purpose statement here, an introductory statement to this document in the preamble. We launch into Article One. Article One begins to talk about the legislative branch, right? We see right off the bat section, I apologize, that should say section one. Section one, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, states, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives, right? So right off the bat, we have Congress. We have the legislative branch of the United States. Why does this section come first? Uh, it's being argued and 
I think perhaps is uh, fairly agreed upon that the Congress is maybe one of the, or maybe is the most important branch of these three branches. We'll note the other branches to come uh, that make up the sort of government powers of the United States. And here we're finding this legislative branch in section one. Article one goes on to describe Congress. Uh, we'll see, get section two. Uh, section two, we see a little bit into what the House of Representatives is. Uh, section three, we start to see the Senate. Uh, as we get further along, and let's see here, section eight, we get the enumerated powers, right? Uh, we start to see which powers are delegated to the Senate and the House, the legislature, the Congress. We see that the Congress has the power to tax, right? Uh, we see that they have the power to borrow money, to regulate commerce, to uh, provide for naturalization and uniform laws for bankruptcy, uh, to make money and regulate the value therein. And then we also see, very importantly, this last final piece of section eight of article one, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested in this constitution by the in the government, by this constitution, the government of the United States. It's very important actually each of these words in the Constitution, the US Constitution. Uh, but this necessary and proper language is what's known as the necessary and proper clause. Some people call this the elastic clause. We will get more into this throughout the other units, but effectively this comes from a phrase, or it doesn't come from a phrase, there was a previous phrase in the Articles of Confederation, which said that each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated. And so it's providing um, to the Continental Congress no powers uh, which are incidental to those expressly delegated. Instead, here we're seeing in the necessary and proper clause of the US Constitution, the subsequent US Constitution, that all incidental powers as they were uh, uh, designated within the Articles of the Confederation almost, basically every power or jurisdiction right, which is not by this Confederation expressly delegated, we're seeing those go to Congress. So instead of going to the states, those are going to Congress. Uh, this created during the forming of the constitution, uh, some or maybe even significant unsettling between the Federalists, for example, and the Anti-Federalists. Federalists, of course, hoping that the powers be limited as they had been in the Articles of the Confederation and thereby providing the states those incidental rights. Uh, Anti-Federalists, of course, hoping that the federal government would have sort of that unlimited power. And we see actually even Alexander Hamilton speaking uh, in Federalist number 33, if you wanna look that up on that um, later on, Federalist paper number 44, these are the, the Federalist papers. Uh, we will talk a little bit about those if we haven't yet. Basically, the Federalist papers were a set of documents. Uh, Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay wrote together uh, almost 100, maybe 80, 85 documents that they wrote together and were, sort of publishing uh, their views and hoping to move from the Confederation Congress uh, into this constitution and, and writing sort of in response to that. Those, we'll go into those another time, or if you have any questions, you can let me know about that and we can do more of it. Um, also, we see in this section, uh, basically some 
of the Congress's abilities to govern the army and navy and things that happen at sea. Uh, I believe it says, yep, to declare war a big uh, power of Congress and to call forth militia, to provide for organizing militia, etc. cetera. Uh, so there, there's a lot within this section eight. So that's a good one to note. Uh, we also find within Article One another clause, which we will mention a lot within right here in this section eight, um, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, right? What does this mean? This is the commerce clause, uh, is, is what it's called. Uh, what it means though, basically it gives Congress, right, the ability to regulate com um, commerce. And there's some, we will talk a little bit about a case called uh, Gonzalez versus Reich um, from 2005, uh, which discusses the commerce clause. Uh, but it's, it's a fairly important uh, piece of this constitution as a whole because it does provide expressly to Congress this ability to regulate commerce within the United States, which we see coming up in actually a, a range of cases, uh, which we will discuss a little bit more. But we also see this mention of Indian tribes, right? And Indian tribes, they call that part the Indian Commerce Clause, actually. Um, and it's providing Congress the express right to regulate commerce with tribes. What that means is the states do not have that express right, okay? And again, we will talk more, we'll get into that further, but I want you definitely to notice that it's right here. And it's one of, uh, one of the mentions of Indian tribes and native peoples within the constitution. And so I believe there are, there are two other mentions uh, of Indians within the constitution, but we will, we will get to them, but this is a, a big one to remember. All right, so moving to, we can, we can look through and I kind of went fast through these other sections, you'll note, Again, section two, House of Representatives, section three, Senate. Uh, section four, we start to talk about when they will assemble. Section five, uh, some more of the basic proceeding, procedural information for those houses. And of course, you can read a lot more into each of these sections. Uh, section nine, we talk about a little bit about the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, the no nobility shall be granted within the United States, uh, looking to protect against any sort of oligarchical or other expression of government that they had seen before when the Continental Congress um, and the Constitution framers were putting this document together. All right, so past section nine and section 10, uh, section 10. And again, each of these sections is actually, you know, extremely important. We're not gonna dwell on them too much, but to give you a just brief insight into what each section notes. And, and some are, for example, section eight are much more uh, worthy of note, but we get into article two. Now, article two, discusses, whereas Article 1 discusses the legislative branch, Article 2 discusses what? Discusses the, I don't know if you can see it there, but the executive power, right? The executive branch. Who do we mean when we talk about the executive power, the executive branch? We mean the president, the duties of the president and the vice president, the president being the head of the executive branch of the federal government, uh, as well as the head of government, right? And the head of state, and Article 2 actually will find in the amendments goes on to be modified by the 12th Amendment, uh, which mentions political parties, okay? And 
indeed the 25th amendment uh, relating to who can secede in the actual office. The president is only to receive compensation from the federal government. Uh, so they are limited, he or she is limited in not being paid elsewhere. And the inaugural oath is meant to defend the constitution. So that what the president does upon taking office, that oath of office, the primary function behind that should be this protection of the constitution. We see within this article two, we see section four provides for the removal of the president. Um, I don't know if we can zoom in on that. The, the president, vice president, and all civil officers shall be removed on impeachment for or conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors. Uh, that is a phrase that is bandied about quite a bit. Um, what does it actually mean? Uh, when the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors came about, uh, basically there's, well, it's, I don't know if we, I don't know if we wanna dive too much too much into the history of this actually. Um, but it came from uh, in England in Suffolk in the 1300s, uh, there was an impeachment of the King's Chancellor. And that was sort of where we first saw uh, this, this impeachment and the reasons for this impeachment. So he had failed to pay uh, a ransom for the city of Ghent um, which then fell to the French, and he'd failed to follow the advice of the uh, parliament to work with a committee to improve his kingdom, I believe. We see it again in the 1400s in England, this idea of impeachment uh, for a duke who was obstructing justice, and committing some sort of uh, public money waste and the charges against him included actually this high treason charge. We see it in the mid, uh, that was the mid 1400s. We see it later on in the 1400s. We see it in the 1600s uh, with the King's attorney general who's impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. And the charges include failing to prosecute actually after starting lawsuits. Uh, and using authority before it actually was his authority to use. In the United States, uh, high in this kind of language is generally meant to relate to special duties uh, that one takes by, or one acquires by taking the oath of office, okay? So these are not lay duties for lack of a better word. Um, these are duties that can only be committed or can only be fulfilled by persons in this position of authority, kind of a unique position of authority, all right? Uh, when we see it used here, it generally is considered to mean, and that later on uh, in the early 1800s, actually Chief Justice Marshall mentions that uh, there are other high crimes and misdemeanors and that in fact that they should be construed basically not according to how they are used modernly. So, and we start to see this in the constitution, this is important to bring up. When we talk about textualism, we're talking about people who are reading the text for what it is. Um, but we're starting to see, even as early as the early 1800s, uh, the justices in the Supreme Court and the Chief Justice, in fact, saying, look, the language in the Constitution isn't as it stands now. We shouldn't interpret this as it stands now. Instead, we should recognize that these are almost terms of art, as is said in the law. These are almost you know, ways of expressing ideas uh, that are maybe 
may be different in terms of language now, but we can get the relevant idea. So instead of looking to exactly the language, we should instead look to what the framers of the constitution meant when they adopted this language. For example, there's a phrase levying war, uh, and that's obviously a, a more technical term, Justice Marshall says, uh, the term was not necessarily meant by the framers. He says it, it is scarcely conceivable that the term was not employed by the framers in the sense that it had been, in the sense which had been affixed to it by those from whom we borrowed it. Uh, so particularly looking to you know, what the framers meant by this language. And so this language, high crimes and misdemeanors has been frequently used to relate to any crimes that uh, are impeachable offenses basically for those in power. So they might be unbefitting of someone of that office or they might be related to crimes specifically for that office um, or otherwise. So if you wanna learn more about that, we can certainly get more into that. I won't keep us on that for too long. We'll instead move to Article 3. Article 3, we start to see the Supreme Court, right? So Article 1, we've got the legislative branch. Article 2, we've got the executive branch. And now we are seeing the judicial branch. And we are seeing the Supreme Court mentioned almost specifically, right? In one Supreme Court and in such superior, inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So it provides Congress this ability to create the lower courts, but does set up this main Supreme Court. And then it goes into uh, the judges, for example, of both of those courts uh, should, shall not, for, for example, actually lose their compensation. You might think that's sort of an odd thing to be bothered about in the constitution. And yet, uh, there's surely a lot written on that. And Article 3 basically describes the type of cases that the court would take as original jurisdiction. We start to see that. Um, and uh, for example, between citizens of the same state or under grants of different states, between uh, different jurisdictions, basically, is what it's saying. Uh, and then various other sort of specific powers for the Supreme Court, which is considered kind of the, their original jurisdiction. Remember, when we talk about jurisdiction in the court system, we're talking about what the court can and cannot hear, what kind of cases. And uh, so we see those more specifically defined in Article 3. Section 1, we see vesting judicial power in federal courts, right? We see that the Supreme Court and the inferior courts. And we see the ability to punish sentence and direct future action to resolve conflicts. There is a later act, uh, 1789, which began to fill in some of the details which you might note are missing herein. And in fact, if you look at the US code as we do in other classes, Title 28 specifically delineates more of the powers and administration of the judiciary. So we note we can get much further into each of these, uh, each of these sections. I will make mention that the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity. Law and equity, we can talk a little bit more about that. There used to be separate courts of law and equity. We now frequently see them combined in the United States arising under this constitution um, and to all cases affecting. So we see this, these cases, and then we see to controversies, okay? Controversies between two or more states, uh, which we would note do have this original jurisdiction of the US Supreme Court, which means you don't have to go through the appellate process in order to try a case between one state and another state. The court does have that jurisdiction if it chooses to hear those cases. 
Um, and what we, we see there's sort of this, these actual cases and controversies. The judicial power isn't covering any cases which are, for example, hypothetical. They're not covering any cases which are moot or which for which they don't have standing or which aren't ripe. They're covering these particular cases uh, where there are actual interests of both sides in the case, where there are, are genuine stakes or genuine things at play, um, this, these cases or controversies. We also note that there are, you know, there's a lot of references to ambassadors, foreign nation states, et cetera. Remember around this time, those were big players in the creation of even the constitution, right? But also the forming of the initial US government where people from other countries, particularly European countries. Um, we might at some further time, talk a little bit about the role of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, a group of native American nations and their role in the constitution and in some of these concepts, uh, but we'll leave that be for now and just move ahead. Uh, we'll note that there's nothing in here which actually expressly authorizes judicial review. What is judicial review, you might ask? Uh, judicial review is basically the power of the Supreme Court or any court, the judiciary, to review the constitutionality of a statute or a treaty. And we certainly will get into that when we talk about uh, Marbury versus Madison, some of these early Supreme Court cases. But it's notable that, and you will find more information on the, the consideration about including judicial review in those Federalist Papers, which we mentioned. You can look to, for example, uh, Federalist Paper number 78. But we see in a early court case uh, in 1800, I believe, Marbury versus Madison, uh, we see the start of the court saying, yes, there is some ability for the judiciary to review the constitutionality of a statute or a treaty. And in fact, this becomes one of the main tenets of judicial power within the constitution, this ability to review constitutionality of legislation, um, and then also for treaties. Uh, so we see that though, not directly or not explicitly, I should say, expressly, I should say, mentioned here in section two, but that's something which we'll note going forward um, is certainly read into uh, this document or the framers ideas. Section three basically is stopping Congress from changing any of the laws uh, on treason by simple majority. It defines treason, right? We see that treason is an overt act. Um, let's see here. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted. What we kind of see here, right, is a check or balance, I should probably a balance on that executive power, which we already saw in Article 2, right? Um, and then also that, which, which was allowed to be impeached, for example, for reasons of treason. Uh, and also noting there are, there's almost a bit of a check on Congress in the section 3.2, but it is providing that Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work uh, corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. So we see that Congress is basically a political body and Political disagreements themselves can't be considered treasonous. So you do allow, you do have sort of the ability to uh, resist the government, and that itself isn't treasonous. Um, but Congress does actually uh, able is able to have sort of lesser crimes, like for example, conspiracy. We will move on to Article Four. Article Four uh, 
not as long as some of our previous articles and we're moving out of the individual articles related to the branches of government. And now we are talking specifically about uh, this concept of federalism, which was so important to the framers of the constitution. We are seeing that the relationships between states and the federal government are outlined. And we see that at the very start with full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. Whoa, that's a big thing, right? So if you go to court in state A, state B should be granting full faith and credit to those proceedings. Uh, and Congress may be may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effects thereof. All right. Um, we see in section two, this privileges and immunities clause, okay? And we'll mention this one again too. Uh, it basically stops one state from discriminating against the citizens of another state. And we mentioned the commerce clause earlier uh, this also means that the right to travel, for example, uh, you, you can't prohibit uh, this, this sort of interstate travel, or rather it is associated with, with that clause, and you can kind of look to that um, within the privileges and immunities. Um, we, can, we will go into that much more, the, that, cl that clause, I don't know about much more actually, but some amount more, especially talking about the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as it relates to some federal Indian law cases. And uh, I'll note though, within Article 4, we do see beginnings of a legal framework for freedom of movement between states. And though we take that, these days, we take that as the way things of course would be that one would be able to move if one was a citizen of the United States or chose to be between one state and another. But back in the day, that was not so easily done, all right? Uh, finally, we find at the end of Article 4, uh, the ability for states and particularly for the government to protect and guarantee states that they have a form of government. And it says a Republican form of government, right? What does that mean? It doesn't mean our modern conceptions of a Republican as opposed to a Democrat. It means in the sense of a Republic, right? A Republic is, we see that word public in there, right? We see that sort of Latin start, raise publica, public affair. A government where power is held by the people and their elected representatives is basically what a republic is. And we see that guarantee within the constitution in article four, section four from the United States to every state. And that includes protecting them against invasion, et cetera, right? All right, article five. Article five, you wanna amend the constitution? Article five is where you go. Uh, Congress, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this constitution. So we not only see that we can amend this constitution and that's written into the constitution, but we see how it can be amended, right? We see that two thirds um, or on the application of the legislatures of two thirds of several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three fourths of several states or by the conventions therein. So we see two steps in this process, okay? We see step one, Congress, two thirds majority, both the Senate and the House, or step two, some sort of national convention. And when we talk about several states, we're, we're broadening that to, to the states now, right? Um, which is how, the framers would have intended it. Uh, so if, for example, two thirds of state legislatures collectively call for a, an amendment. Um, and if they do that, um, and there are, well, there are two basically procedures for ratifying. 
uh, ratifying means uh, bringing into legal existence, almost giving formal consent to making it officially valid. We see that there are two procedures for that, the consent of state legislatures or alternately the consent of state ratifying conventions. And so the ratification method is chosen by Congress for each amendment and states ratifying conventions um, actually haven't been much of a big thing, right? There actually hasn't, we haven't seen those put into use over the years since the founding or since the, the creation of the US constitution, except for once. Uh, can anyone guess what that once was? I will let you know it was actually the 21st amendment. Do you remember what that one is? Uh, that is the repeal to the prohibition on alcohol. So that is what people are coming together in their states and conventions for. Uh, Article five ends by protecting uh, certain clauses in this government from being amended, right? We see that certain clauses can't actually be amended or rather we see the restrictions on amending certain clauses. All right, we'll move on to article six. And of course you can go back and look at any of these articles more and I encourage you to do so. Article six basically establishes the constitution as the supreme law of the land, right? Uh, anything else comes second to the constitution. Every state's judges are going to be bound by it. Uh, and anything in the laws or constitutions of any states notwithstanding, it recognizes that there is a national debt uh, and it requires those oaths, which we talked about with the president earlier. Uh, it also means that you can't, for example, have a state's constitution or, uh, or laws that conflict with the federal constitution, okay? States are bound to honor federal laws. And we see this in the creation of laws by Congress, which then the states have to follow, right? And that's, that's actually not, not a small thing. Um, our last article, we have article seven of this original frame of the constitution. Article seven, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution. What are we doing here? We are ratifying the constitution in article seven, okay? It's probably the least it's maybe the least interesting of the clauses and the least modernly applicable clauses because we're looking at um, the actual just ratification of the constitution. I haven't included it herein. Um, actually, I can put it in there for you to see for a second. Uh, but here are the signed names, those endorsements um, of those of some of those who signed the US constitution. Now that happened in 1787. There were 39 delegates to the convention, to the Constitutional Convention, who signed uh, this constitution. And uh, yeah, there, there's a couple, a couple other things at the end of the constitution. There's sort of a closing protocol, um, a delegation that the people, or a, a mention that the, the delegates work basically has been complete, who created the constitution and uh, actually some handmade amendments within the actual final document and a signature there to validate authenticity. So we note that there are then the amendments and for the amendments we'll actually open up the Senate page And start on here. Amendment one, in addition to having memorized the preamble, you might have had to memorize this in grade school. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, amendments to the US Constitution. We know that that was a process, as you remember, which 
was in Article 5, right? We actually have the particular process by which to amend the constitutions. So that was certainly contemplated in the creation of the constitution. And we see actually within Article 5, uh, you know, this again, this idea that it either has to be adopted by Congress by these means or by a national convention. Uh, these days, everything is through Congress, right? It has to receive a sort of supermajority, two thirds of the votes of both houses. And actually, unlike other legislation, there is no ability for the president, for example, to veto it. It goes straight to the office of the Federal Register. The Federal Register is a, will we'll likely look at it. Um, it is a recording of uh, what has gone on in government and effectively the, the laws and it creates laws kind of in slip, slip law, as they say, um, which then go out to the states. So ratified amendments. Um, we start in our looking at ratified amendments with this, these amendments one, two, and three. You can see here uh, that they are all from the sort of 1791 amending period. Four actually is two, as is five, as is six, as is seven, right? 1791 was a busy year. But these first three are protecting the liberty to which the US Constitution subscribes even as early as in its preamble, right? That was one of two main goals in the preamble um, were to one of the second of which was to protect the liberty, right? For future generations included. And so the first amendment, you can't obstruct individual freedoms. You're gonna have the ability to have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, assembly, the right to petition, right? Free exercise, you get to practice whatever religion you want. The establishment clause we see also within here. The establishment clause is basically, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. It is a second uh, form of security against preventing complete religious control. We'll remember that when this document was created, uh, not long after, for example, the Declaration of Independence, but also not long after, you know, the 1600s, wherein religious pilgrims or people freeing religious prosecution uh, came to uh, the area, which was then under tribal control, um, which became known as Northern America, North America, and then the United States or the colonies, and then the United States. Um, but we see in here Congress not Congress, I should say, but the First Amendment doubling down on its protection of freedom of religion. Um, ironic in some senses, when we look at what was then done to uh, affect the religions of the native people who were here prior to the creation of the United States on their soil. But we also note in the amendments from this time, the Second Amendment, and if you are a fan or a follower or otherwise pay attention to the news, um, you may very well have heard of uh, the NRA. And the NRA uh, is primarily concerned with this part of the Constitution, the Second Amendment. Why, you ask? Because it considers the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Now, they don't mean bear arms uh, like I, don't, I forget, are bears ungulates? I, I guess they're probably not, but they don't mean actual physical bear arms. Clearly, uh, they mean the ability to carry weapons, right, and have weapons, um, guns in particular, firearms, other weapons. Uh, third Amendment, you can tell I'm getting tired, but we're only on number three uh, from 1791, uh, is this prohibition on forcing people to quarter soldiers in their houses, right? So you can't actually be forced to keep someone in your house who you don't want there necessarily. Um, and that part of the reason for that was again, this prior resentment against the British who had forced people to take in British soldiers. And so we do see within the constitution, a lot of 
or more than might be expected, um, sort of contemporaneous references. And why might that be, do you ask, like contemporaneous to that time? Uh, and that's, I think the reason is fairly obvious is, is that's something that people were concerned with and not just those who were looking toward those future generations, uh, but rather those who were looking to the constitution to be a document which cemented this new nation in a world different from which uh, people had come or the people who were writing this document had come. In amendments four, five, six, seven, eight, we begin to see the shapings of the constitutional protections um, which relate very much to the law, right? We see this prevention, preventing or this prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures. Searches and seizures, the use of those two words together shall there forwith go on and on into where we are now, right? We still see these words together, searches and seizures. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, okay? And no warrants shall be issued, but upon probable cause. Well, that sounds familiar, right? Yes, now we have this idea of reasonable, reasonable suspicion as well, but we started with this idea of only probable cause shall allow sort of warrants. Um, and and it still is the case for warrants to be issued, right? You might still, you might get searched or seized now, um, but warrants are still needed under probable cause um, to do a real big old search of your place. Uh, and we'll talk, we can talk about that more at some future point. Well, oh, the Fifth Amendment, uh, you gotta be able to be tried by a jury, right? You can't be tried for the same crime twice, no double jeopardy. Uh, you have to have these fair procedures. And in fact, you can't be forced, you shall not be compelled in a criminal case to be witness against yourself, okay? I'm taking my Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination or something, okay? Um, and that you won't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. These amendments, they are so important, especially having looked at those other sections of the Constitution, let it be clear that these amendments are really uh, the foundation almost as much, if not more, of the society that we live in today in America, in the US, for those who live in the US. So the Sixth Amendment provides more protections and we start to see this legal counsel, right? So you might have your Fifth Amendment right not to self-incrimination, but you might have your Sixth Amendment right to have an attorney and that is severely limited, right? If you're a juvenile, if you are, there's a lot of incidences in which right now there aren't presently, uh, if you're in civil court, it, um, presently attorney is provided. Um, in civil court, it's, it's probably because it has to do with a taking away of actual freedom, right? There's less of a chance of that in civil court. Um, but, so you're not actually being deprived of life or liberty, um, though you might be being deprived of them in different ways, and certainly you are probably being deprived of property, but that you have this due process of law and that private property, in fact, can't be taken without just compensation. So we have kind of the Fourth Amendment, um, and then we have this Fifth Amendment. Um, we get this, this sort of takings idea you can't just take things. Um, the government can't just take land, for example, without providing some just compensation. Seventh Amendment, uh, we see that you've got the right um, to a jury trial in civil cases, actually. Um, you don't necessarily have the right to an attorney there, but you've got the right to a jury trial. Uh, and Courts can't overturn a jury's finding of fact. Uh, so we know it's, it's an impartial jury. Um, and we also see that there's a, some compulsion for 
the ability to get witnesses in one's favor so that there is a, a both sides being equal idea. Um, Eighth Amendment, uh, you basically shouldn't have bail or fines set to an amount so high that only rich people can pay them. We do see that very frequently now, uh, which is sort of interesting. Obviously, this document notes $20, right? Now, clearly $20 isn't the same thing now as it was in the 1700s, but uh, this idea, this idea that Marshall noted in that early court case, um, this idea that we are looking to what the framers meant, not to necessarily their actual words, not to the actual $20, but the idea of what $20 would have meant back then. Um, and we are going forward from that perspective. So we maybe could consider that, you know, I don't know what it would be if you looked at inflation and everything else would be $1,000 or something, but we maybe consider that this Eighth Amendment protection against unreasonable, that word isn't used, but basically against unreasonable uh, bail or fines uh, might be on occasion being sort of this, you know, not actually held up these days. But what is, what this phrase has been taken to mean is to protect against overly harsh punishments um, for crimes and even uh, to look at, you know, whether or not really terrible prison conditions uh, are allowable within what the framers were trying to say within this Seventh Amendment clause. Uh, in, obviously we, I'm sorry, Seventh and Eighth Amendment clauses, goodness gracious. Thank you for, for catching me, but yeah, the Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines shall be imposed. Amendments nine through 10 or nine and 10, we see some powers which are unenumerated um, powers not delegated to the United States are prohibited, are reserved to the states and or the people. So we finally see these sort of federalists coming back around, right? Um, so it, there's a question as to what an unenumerated rights includes. Does that include the right to travel, vote, privacy, you know, your body, yourself? Um, and the Supreme Court has felt different ways on those issues. We can talk about those more. Tenth Amendment is part of this Bill of Rights um, to further define the power between uh, the states and the government, this federalism, which we see throughout. Um, so let's be clear, these first 10 amendments do make up the Bill of Rights. Uh, it also makes clear, you know, these powers do include the ability to make war, they include the ability to collect taxes, regulate interstate business, even though it doesn't say that specifically, that's what actually it does, I should say, but that's what we are making clear here. And this uh, ninth and 10th amendment are fairly big amendments. Um, and I'm so sorry, not ninth and 10th. These ninth and 10th amendments are not very big amendments. Um, but then we get into the 11th and 12th amendments, all right? So we've got nine and 10, the enumerated in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people and the powers delegated um, to the United States by the constitution nor prohibited to it are reserved, but not delegated nor prohibited are reserved to the states, okay. Uh, 11 and 12, 12 we get into, as I was saying before I kind of jumped the gun, um, a much, bigger amendment and really this is part we can look for forward um and we won't do too much of these uh into these what they call sort of government amendments processes and procedures amendments uh 12 modifies the electoral college we also see similar uh type language in the 17th amendment from 1913 which looks at how senators are elected the 20th amendment 1933 which looks at when presidents and congress change offices uh the 22nd amendment 1951 limiting 
the term of an elected president eight years after Roosevelt, right? Because um, Roosevelt was elected to a third and then a fourth term. The 25th Amendment, what happens when president, you know, removed, you might've heard that in the news not too long ago, the 27th Amendment, preventing Congress from getting pay raises. So these kind of government processes and procedures amendments. Um, after that, though, we get 13, 14, 15, and then even into 19, 23, 24, 26 amendments safeguarding civil rights. These are hugely important amendments um, abolishing, for example, in this 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, abolishing slavery um, and involuntary servitude, um, hugely important. I'll note that involuntary servitude is still allowed as punishment for crime, right? Um, but basically, author not basically, but authorizing Congress to enforce abolition. Do you remember what abolition means? Abolition is the end of slavery, okay? 14th Amendment, all people who were slaves become US citizens. Um, okay, that, that goes more into depth, but 15th Amendment, you cannot discriminate in who votes. Um, on the basis of race, color, or condition of servitude. All right, 19th Amendment. 19th Amendment, women, where are you at? 19th Amendment, women have the same right to vote as men do. That didn't come until 1920. Let's note that. Um, some states did actually allow women to hold office before then, but only 1920. So this year is 2021 or I don't know when you're gonna be watching this video, but in the 2020s, no doubt. So only a hundred years ago, did women get the ability to have kind of a role in this somewhat equivalent to men in this voting structure, at least. Uh, the 22nd Amendment, oh, I won't touch into the too much. Um, the 20th Amendment we see there. Um, those amendments are part of those government process amendments that I talked about. Um, 23rd Amendment, get down to that, uh, allows the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., to vote uh, almost as though it were a state. There are some differences, but it does allow those citizens to have a say uh, in the Electoral College, actually. Um, by the mid 1900s, the population of DC had expanded substantially. When DC was first established, there was not very many people who lived there. There were the people who working in government and, you know, around maybe 5,000 people. There wasn't even really a local government. 5,000 people compared to where we live with no government seems obscene in towns of, you know, a thousand around where we are here. But uh, now DC has three quarters of a million people or more. And clearly um, those are a lot of people to deny the ability to vote to if you are protecting the ability to vote um, in the United States to US citizens under the constitution. 24th uh, amendment and then 26th amendment, we see you can't have a tax for voting. Um, some of those are, are leftover laws from uh, pre-abolition. Uh, meant to keep people down. There are actually, and you can watch some videos on these things or do some readings on a lot of uh, the language that was put into the constitution and to legislation at, at and around those times um, of the falling of the South uh, or of the combined, uh, you know, ending of the Civil War you start to see a lot of potential pieces of legislation and even changes within the constitution, which appear to be addressing um, concerns of the South or their subsequent actions about those concerns. But the 26th amendment, 26, let's get down here. Um, we see that you can't prohibit citizens um, from voting uh, on account of age, um, except for, you know, basically to 18, right? 18 years or older. Uh, 
and 18 is of course the year at which people can join the military independently. Uh, the Congress shall have power to enforce that article by appropriate legislation. All right, we see again, almost the government process amendment there. There are a, uh, I guess we can get to 27, no law bearing compensation shall take effect until election of representatives shall have intervened. So you have to elect them first. Um, unratified amendments. We won't get into those too much, but that's just to say that um, there are usually over a hundred amendments actually, believe it or not, proposed uh, by the legislative branch, by the House and the Senate um, each couple of years. Most of them don't get in there. A couple of them go through and do actually get enough uh, votes in Congress to begin the constitutional ratification process. Um, but that is a significant process. So you'll note that we have had the last uh, actual amendment in 1992, and we haven't had one since then. Um, and prior to that, 1971, prior to that, 1967, a little bit closer there, but these were civil rights, post-civil rights things. Um, actually, I guess they weren't, but they were sort of government forming, or I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure, government forming amendments. Um, but with that, I will bid you adieu and say thank you for sticking with me through looking at the text of the constitution and then the amendments. And after this brief overview, we will certainly dive into the language within some of those sections as well as some of those amendments much more and look at how the courts have interpreted them and look at what they mean for uh, the US society and then other adjoining societies today. Thank you.